Warning, the following discussion contains subject material that some viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Greetings, everyone. I am the Weasel, and this is my co-host, Octavia. Hello! And today, we are going to be talking about The Crow. One of the books, I think, to ever have been written. Uh, one of the... I, would, it, would would we call it influential in a way? Um, iconic? Yeah, well, uh, definitely iconic, of course, but I think influential Impact. to a degree, because I think it... Yeah. I was, oh, no, I if it in... wasn't the one that started the anti-hero trend of independent comic books in the 90s, it certainly was one of the most popular. Yeah, it solidified it. Absolutely. All right. Yes. And since this is the Weasel's pick, yes, we finally got back to the Weasel since uh, he got two in a row, I got two in a row, but now we're back on our uh, normal program. This was his we're pick, We're back so... to the good stuff, baby. My stuff is good. You liked John Constantine. Yeah, it was all right. Yeah. Anyways, right. since this is the Weasel's pick, I'm going to let him give a brief description of it and uh, how we got into it. All right, so peep this. The Crow is about this, like, weirdo in white paint with a uh, black lipstick on. He is brought back to life by a bird. It makes more sense in the comic. And then he roams the streets of Detroit, and he murders the people who murdered him and his side piece. I mean, wife. Uh, fiance, actually. They hadn't gotten married yet. Fiance, wife, I don't know the difference. <laughs> I'm never getting a girlfriend. Screw everyone. Anyway, this is one of the greatest comic books ever written. You know, I, I already said that. Mm -hmm. You know, it was made into a movie. More people, I think, are familiar with the movie than they are with the comic book, just because it was a, a, the whole controversy surrounding it in terms of, like, its star and, uh, you know, his who he was related to and what ended up happening to him and the unfortunate fact that, you know, he never got to have a career. We'll get more into that as the uh, comic goes on. Or as the podcast goes on, sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And how All we right. got into so, it? Yeah, let's talk about how we got into it. Well, I got into it of you just suggesting it, and, well, I read it and I liked it. How'd you get into it? I got into it, first of all, I heard about The Crow first from an Angry Video Game Nerd video, I want to say back in 2016, if somebody can correct me on that, where he reviewed a sequel, or uh, the game, to one of the sequels of the movie, City of Angels, which I have not seen and I do not plan to see. But in the video, he talked about The Crow and how it was one of the big movies of the early 90s. So that got me interested in it, or at least had it in the back of my mind. And then sometime later, uh, I think I mentioned it to someone, and my aunt, who was around at the time and had a huge crush on Brandon Lee, uh, talked about the movie and, again, how big it was. So I'm like, you know what? I'll check this out for myself. So I did. It was great. I looked up the soundtrack, and a lot of bands that I had already been listening to were on the soundtrack, so that just, like, enhanced the tone for me. And then I found out that it was based on a comic book. I'm like, you know what? I gotta read the comic book. I read the comic book, looked up, like, the backstory of it, and that's what got me into reading the comic for this podcast and why I wanted to talk about it. Yay! Yeah. Alrighty, so that being said, as usually, uh, pardon, as usual, we will have a spoiler-free section where we just uh, get the uh, give a general uh, our our general overall opinion, and then we're gonna have a spoilerific section where we talk talk about the things we liked, then the things we didn't like, and we're finally just gonna have a little conclusion with you know other things worth mentioning. Um, so to start off our spoiler-free opinions, um, I like it. Um, I do like the book a lot more than I liked the movie. The book was felt a lot more spiritual and, I guess, intimate, and it just also felt a lot more focused and a lot more... It felt more original and like its own thing and like it knew what it wanted to be. And I, and I appreciated that, and it was something that I hadn't um, 
I don't think I've come across something like that before, or at least if I did, I didn't read it. The movie isn't a bad movie, but it was too much of just an action movie, and it, it kind of, um, it, it was, well, yeah, basically, it was too much of an action movie, and it was less spiritual, and... Uh, it also had a bit of a lighter tone, which I do appreciate. It it, uh, it just was more of a dark comedy than uh, than the book, and I that that was actually a nice touch. And there were some improvements, but it also had this like tw added this uh, twenty minute long end sequence, which just felt unnecessary and just. Yeah, that kind of pulled me out of it. If it didn't have that 20 minute bit, I might enjoy the movie more, but it did, and that just kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. So, I mean, if, in all honesty, if what we're just, my overall recommendation is, if you would like, if you like dark stories about vengeance and stuff like that, or, and I, I don't think, actually, I don't even think we've mentioned the main reason or topic of this comic yet the entire thing is about um basically about grief so this guy you know he and his wife get murdered and he comes back from the dead to avenge them and the and even though you know the plot is about you know going off and getting vengeance it is mostly about like processing grief and like also trauma because they're murdered in a very brutal way so it's it's not just the fact that his, somebody he loved died it's also the fact that he was, you know, he was rough. I'm trying to think of a of a proper way to. Well, yeah, he was attacked, and yeah. so yeah, that I liked that. I liked how we actually got to talk about that in depth. While the movie was, as I said, much more of an action dark comedy, and although it did have its emotional parts, it it did feel much more. It, it, they weren't. They didn't. They weren't as intimate as the book. So yeah, that's that's where I stand. Uh, Weasel. Hey, see, I'm actually kind of of the opposite opinion. I don't necessarily think that the movie is better than the book, but I think they both stand like in their own right. The whole uh, mysticism part. I actually think that the movie left a lot of, like, the crow lore more up to the imagination, and it made it more, like, mysterious and interesting, mm. like, in its own right. Yeah. Yeah, but I do agree with your uh, view that it is about processing grief. We'll get more into that in the spoilers, because it's a, a lot more than just the story itself that's about processing grief. This entire, like, series is kind of a... Uh, a superstitious man would call it cursed, but mm. I just I just consider it very an interesting story, both in terms of the story itself and the story around it, which actually adds to the story. Right. It's one of the yeah, it's one of the few cases where like a story is actually improved by finding out how it was made as yeah. opposed to just being something extra if you really like the story. Right. So yeah, I recommend the comic. I of course recommend researching also the story behind the comic, which we're going to talk in in the spoiler section. And I also, unlike you, I also recommend the movie. I think that it's great. I actually think that the action, like the action, is one of the biggest parts of the movie, just because you know right. the guy who starred it, Brandon Lee, he was the son of Bruce Lee. Yeah. So oh no. He did a lot of his. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm going to interrupt you here. I do like the movie and I do recommend it if you're into that thing. I just think the comics better. That's fair enough. Yeah. Uh yeah. continue. I just I just wanted to say that. I mean, I I don't really have much more to say more about it in the spoilers. Just, you know, read the comic, watch the movie. I don't care in what order. Avoid the sequels. There you go. Yeah. I I I would say read the comic first. Um but yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's our spoiler-free review or summary and recommendation. If what we're talking about sounds like something you'll like, you'll probably love it. If something, if it sounds like something you don't like, mm, yeah, probably skip it. I will say I don't. Uh, we should probably say this I, uh, before we move on. This does. We are gonna. I'm, I'm gonna put forth a trigger warning right now, because we do deal with like 
a lot of heavy topics. We do, you know, there's, you know, violence, uh, sexual assaults, and probably a lot of other things that I'm going to, f that I've forgotten right now. So right now I'm just going to put out a general trigger warning, so if you don't want to talk about heavy subjects like those, now is the time to leave, and if you don't and suffer for it, I will not be held responsible. All right. So now we're heading forward into the spoiler section, and first up, things we liked. Uh, do you want to start? Absolutely. The art is one of the first things to mention about this. Because it is a black and white comic book, of course, so a lot of it is, like, done in pen. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of gray in the comic, from what I've noticed. There's a lot more, it's more like the, it's black and white. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. Very, like, noir style. It also helps with establishing the the world of the story and, like, the tone that it's going for. Like, there is good and there is evil. Right. Yeah. The setting in the art also helps because it, it, it takes place in Detroit. However, it doesn't show off any Detroit landmarks or establish any sort of life in the city quite the opposite actually it, it shows a lot of urban decay and it yeah. shows like helps create this dreary dark chaotic atmosphere that would take place in detroit on devil's night i mean granted i've never been to detroit but from what i've heard people describe it as people from the city yeah i don't know yeah. i've never been to detroit either <laughs> actually funnily enough um, you're probably gonna laugh at this, but I was rediscovering a lot of old cartoons from my childhood. Basically ones that I got attached to, but I could never finish because, you know, we only had basic cable and they didn't show all the episodes. But, um, one of the- one of those was Transformers Animated, and I actually kind of had to laugh because the story starts in D Detroit, but it's like this totally pimped out futuristic yeah. um futuristic Detroit because in that universe, like, they had access to alien technology and, like, they so I I just found it funny that like uh, right as you right before we were gonna talk about this we saw another like I, I saw another version of Detroit that was all sparkly and clean and like we've got little baby robots helping us do their our chores and stuff I just I just yeah, thought actually, that was funny to mention <laughs> yeah I was gonna say because I've also been watching a lot of like you know playing video games and like watching shows and that take place in Detroit that I didn't even notice before. And I think the thing about it is a lot of, like, games and movies and stuff portray Detroit in, like, a sci-fi setting yeah. as, like, a booming city, which at a time Detroit was. It was the home of, like, Ford and automobile engineers and stuff like that. There were a lot of, like, factories there that made cars in, like, the early 1900s. And then in the late 1900s, the 90s, when The Crow was written, yeah, there was a lot of, like, urban decay just because a lot of those factories had their jobs outsourced and a lot of people were laid off work. So there's, like, a stark contrast between how movies like, let's say, uh, RoboCop or games like Detroit Become Human and... Uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution, like, things like that portray Detroit in, yeah. like, terms of technology. Right. Yeah. Right. It's an interesting, yeah, interesting contrast there. Yeah. The other weird thing is, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm just not paying attention enough, but, like, you know when they're trying to do, you know, like, tell you, oh, this is New York, they show you the Statue of Liberty, or if they were trying to show you Pennsylvania, they'll show you that building with the Statue of Penn on it. Um, yeah, or William, William Penn. Penn. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, or if they're, you know, we're in Chicago, they'll show the metal bean or something like that. They, I can't, I didn't notice any, like, landmarks or anything like that that would tell you that this was Detroit. Like, honestly, I didn't realize this was Detroit until you told me. Yeah, the only landmark I, th I actually know of in Detroit, I don't even think it's, like, in Detroit, in Detroit is, like, Eminem's mansion. Huh. And even then, that's, like, not even an actual part of the city. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that would have... D Detroit in media, honestly, is... It's always portrayed as either, like, an economic boom in, like, either period pieces or sci-fi shows. And other than that, it's portrayed as a... For, for lack of a better term, a shithole. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Which I think fits the tone of the crow really well and oh, yeah, the whole be... atmosphere is trying to go for. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, the um blah, 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 what was I saying? I do back to the actual topic of the arts. I do really like it. Sometimes it's a little too exaggerated, but like as an artist myself, I like I appreciate that he managed to do this all in black and white, and I really do like the change between like the stark just plain ink drawings versus like how um how when it changes to the past, it takes like more of a a pencil like it, you know, it's a pencil portrait or something like that. Um Yeah. Either that or charcoal, but I'm pretty sure it's used with pencil. So I do like how that was used to like establish the, the like you know to instantly cue us into what time we were and like you know how and the tone of the scene. Uh, that's a that's a common that is a common method to like change your style between flashbacks and stuff. But I don't think it's used to its full potential a lot of the times. Most of the time, most of the time I see it in TV shows. Where they're just using a different art style to spice things up, or um, or if they're trying to cue you in to like tell you that this is part of a certain continuity, like this is a sequel show to a different show that you watched. But um, I th think this is the first time I've seen it done in a comic. Like you know, I've seen art styles changed, you know, because they changed the artist. But I think this is the first time I've seen it done in a comic, or at the very least, done well. And yeah. one thing that ca kind of bothered me is that I was, like, reading, I think, one of the author's notes or something, and one thing that bothered me is how he, like, kind of emphasized that it was all done with pencil and pen and stuff, and I was kind of annoyed by that, like, how he was sort of, it seemed like he was bragging about the fact that he didn't use digital art. And I'm gonna say, as somebody who works in both traditional and digital art mediums, both are really difficult. Like, when you're working with a digital art yeah, it's, yeah, it, you can copy and paste backgrounds and you can like maybe shrink things. Certain things are easier, but a lot of the, but a lot of the times it's also more difficult because, you know, you're working it's you, you can't just see like it's not just press when you press down with a brush, you watch it expand and you can control it like i have a lot more control over an ink brush tradi like a physical traditional ink brush than i do over uh, a digital one like it's very it's a lot easier for me to get the line work i want done traditionally the only the only advantage i have on the digital art is that i have the undo button so i can just hit undo when i don't get the right line but it's often but uh, like uh, basically what i'm saying is i hate it when people kind of uh, like disres or kind of act like digital art is this like lesser art form because you have things like the undo button or the copy paste. It's like no, it still requires a lot of it. You it still requires you to understand things like proportions and light sources and weight and stuff like that. And in some cases, it in like in some cases it can be easier, but in some cases it can be harder. And depending on what program you use you might actually have to have as much mathematical knowledge as you do art knowledge, like, especially if you're doing 3D. If you're doing 3D modeling, that's... You need to have at least a basic understanding of math in order to be able to do that. But uh, that's that's yeah. just something I wanted to get off my chest, because I, I hate it when people treat digital art as it's, the, like, the some lower form of art. Like, no, stop doing that. I actually don't think it was supposed to be a knock against digital art because digital art wasn't even a thing. Was it even a thing in like the late 80s, early 90s when this was written? Because what I think it mostly was supposed to pertain to is the fact that this is like an independent comic that's done with limited resources. It's the same reason people like bands like, uh, or like most punk rock bands because it's very DIY. I think the most inspirational mm. thing about The Crow is that it shows that you can be like one guy in your room somewhere writing doodles on a notebook and you too can make a comic. I mean, I do yeah. agree that it is easier, especially with digital art and not even just in terms of doing the art itself, but like actually getting it published and getting it put out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you yourself have a uh, uh, published a comic, right? That's... Yeah. And that yeah. was digital art. And I'm working on another one right now. 
Um, I'm working on a Sandman fan comic, and I'm using digital art, but I'm thinking I might switch to traditional art, because the, the only, I, it's, I found that it's faster for me to draw and ink a comic page in traditional art than it is in digital art. My only problem is, uh, getting a scan, something to scan it and take it into the, the computer. That's the only problem I'm facing right now. But, um, yeah, back to- Yeah, but I mean, the- I just wanted to conclude with, like, the thing about uh, this comic book is it's very DIY. I don't think it's necessarily mocking digital art, although there are plenty of people who would uh, mm. belittle, you know, digital art. Right. I don't feel like James O'Barr is one of them, though. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I didn't take into account when it was written. Um, I, I, I guess it was just kind of how the word, how the way, the way it was, the, the, it sounded like he was, but I guess, yeah, I can see it as sort of a... in that way. But, yeah. I was gonna say, it is a good point to make, though. Mm hmm Like, not necessarily against James O'Barr, but just, like, maybe towards uh, people Snobs. who do art like this in general. Yeah. 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 Watercolor is... like, I find, like, I find watercolor fairly easy and quick to do, but there are other people who find it difficult. So what medium is and isn't easy really comes down to who's holding the pen. Yep. But anyways, um, I think that's do all we have to say about the art. Do we want to say anything else? I think the only other thing I want to point out is that most, only most of the flashbacks are done in pencil. The only flashback that isn't done in pencil is the actual scene where Eric Draven and his fiance get murdered. Right. And that's why I think that the uh, change in art is more a reference to the tone of the scene rather than the actual time and place that it's depicting. Right. Because while all the scenes with uh, his fiance are very like a. Uh, Light, whimsical done in pencil very like whimsical blurry uh, stuff like that as if you're looking back at a memory yeah i think that's more to do with the way uh eric draven looks back on those memories like they might not have even gone the way that he remembers them it's just a feeling he get when he right. remembers it that way whereas opposed to the actual traumatic thing that happened he remembers with like the utmost clarity and it's a horrific memory, so it's going to have the same uh, sharp, uh, edgy, dark uh, art that the rest of the comic does when he's right. actually going out and murdering the people who killed right. him and his fiance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just thought that was an interesting detail as I was reading the comic, because I thought that all the flashbacks were going to be in pencil, but just that one wasn't. Right. Right. But yeah, all yeah, right. I think that's all we got to say about the art. Okay, well, the next point is how raw it feels. Um, and yeah, I was the one who put this down, but you made some other notes, and I don't really know how else to describe it other than, I guess, intimate. Like, a lot of, like, um, with some of our other, the other comics we've read, one of my complaints, uh, was that the characters didn't feel like they were expressing enough. It felt like they were trying way too hard to be badass. And so it, we didn't actually get to see them suffer or struggle. And as a result, I didn't feel connected to them and I just kind of got bored. I think uh, the Daredevil one we read was a good example of that. Um, Daredevil Man Without Fear. This is kind of the yeah. opposite. And I think this is a, and I, this is a good example of how you can have a character be upset and be vulnerable, but still have them be badass. Like, you know, vulnerability is essentially, it isn't just, you know, crying and, you know, telling people how this traumatic event happened to you. It's also telling people about the good things that happened to you. Vulnerability is just expressing yourself and, you know, telling somebody else who you are. It, and I, I hate it that we kind of associate that with, like, being weak. I mean, yes, it's, yes, you are giving somebody the chance to hurt you, but at the same time, you know, like, you know, you're giving somebody knowledge and they could use that knowledge to hurt you. But at the same time, that's what, you know, helps us connect to other people. And, yeah, so, like, we've, we, uh, we get to see pretty much firsthand everything about how Eric is feeling, and it doesn't make him, and, and it, 
you know, it makes us love him, and yet we still get to see, and yet we still get to see him be badass. Because being badass is basically just, um, I guess, getting a job done very efficiently. Would that be like a good, I would that be a good de definition of badass? I think it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's along those lines, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess getting a job done, getting a hard job done very efficiently, and we can talk about, maybe we can define badass later. Chopping some heads later. together, yeah. Yeah. Chopping some wood. Uh, yeah. I, I guess kicking ass and taking names. <laughs> I'll kick ass and taking take names and then me. give those names to other people. Kicking names and taking ass, yep. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, but, uh, what I wanted to insert was how the when I said how the story was made in the uh, notes, I'm talking about how the the backstory of the writer James O'Barr. Right. So the the story of the crow is actually loosely based on something that happened to him in real life. He did have a fiance that he was going to marry that he met, I think, in like high school or something. They were together for years. And then she ends up dying in a car accident, which is why in the comic book, the scene where uh, Eric and his fiance are murdered takes place on the side of a road. Because, I mean, granted, I don't actually know this, but I'm pretty sure a similar place to that is where the actual death took place. So after uh, his fiance died, James O'Barr, you know, obviously he was depressed, he was angry with the world. He ended up uh, joining the Marines for a few years and got a job uh, illustrating the combat manuals for them, mm -hmm. which is how he, I think, got into publishing and how he ended up making The Crow. And The Crow itself went through, like, many different publishers over its release before it was eventually, like, combined into one graphic novel, which is uh, the one we got. Right. But the whole story is based on that event, which is why it, it's both its greatest strength and its greatest weakness, the fact that it was based on something so personal. And it's a great right. strength because it shows off that raw emotion. Like, it, it's like he feels like... It, it's, attempt, it's an attempt to cope with that tragedy, mm -hmm. and it's also an attempt to get some catharsis for it 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 shows his anger and it shows his sorrow and he pours like everything not just into the writing but into the illustration the way the whole story was made you just you feel that emotion mm -hmm. and i think that and i do agree that is something that a lot of comic books don't have simply because i don't think they try to put that kind of emotion because they don't have that raw emotion. I mean, it's also a weakness. We'll get into that later, but that's yeah. one of the major things that I love about this story and one of the major things I think everybody loves about this story. Right. Yeah. All right. All right, our next point and I'm I think you might disagree with me on this one, but the crow. I do disagree and, with it, but go ahead. Yeah, the crow. And when I say the crow, I mean like the actual crow that follows Eric around in the comic. I guess the best way to describe it is probably like a psychopomp or like a guardian or something. But basically, there's this talking crow, like and a spiritual he, guide. Yeah, and um, yeah, I forget what crows symbolize in. Well, it depends on which culture you're in, but you know. Um, but you know, basically, this is a psychopomp, and it keeps talking to him. And the main reason I like this, like, he keeps, like, Eric keeps flashing back to, um, and, like, having flashes of, like, seeing, um, his fiancé being murdered. He keeps, you know, he keeps having flashbacks to the traumatic event. And the bird keeps saying, don't look, Eric. Don't look, Eric. You stupid, you know, you stupid man. Why did you look? You know, he keeps saying things like that. And the main reason I liked it is because... Well, I, you know, I've never been through something as traumatic as what Eric has been through. I mean, obviously, I wasn't murdered, and I've never been raped or physically assaulted or, you know... You know, I've never gone through anything like that. However, I have gone through a lot of trauma, and that the crow, to some extent, felt like the voice in your head that I've had in my head when you're flashing back to these events. 
Like, I won't give anything specific for privacy reasons, and because I don't want to ruin my day. But that was the main reason I liked it, is because I didn't- Because as much as I thought the crow was a psychopomp, it also kind of felt like a part of Eric's own head or a voice that was, like, sort of talking to him. And I don't know if you've had this before or if you were willing to talk about it, but, like, you know- there, there are a lot of times where I've been having, like, panic attacks or on the verge of one, and I do kind of... Eat. I don't physically hear something, like, I don't physically hear a voice, but you have those thoughts that sound like the crow's dialogue running through your head. And so that felt like a good... That just, that just hit me. That just kind of hit home for me in a way of, like, oh yeah, I totally understand what the author's trying to go there for. Uh, I'm stumbling over my words, but I hope my point is got getting across. Yeah, it's it's getting across. Yeah. yeah, and you you said you didn't. I remember you said you watched the movie first, where the crow doesn't talk, and you said it was weird. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, just... I mean the thing about the crow. I mean, I didn't have that same connection with him that you did. I understand mm -hmm. from a narrative perspective why they would make the crow talk because like. You know, it, it's a character in the book, and mm -hmm. obviously it's supposed to have that sort of character. What I like about the movie, though, is that the Crow's character isn't told through dialogue. It's mm -hmm. told through cinematography. It's told through the actual movement of the Crow. You don't yeah. need to hear it talk because what it's trying to tell Eric is obvious within the, sh the uh, movie itself. Yeah. But I felt like the crow yeah. in the comic had a lot more personality. Like, the crow in the comic was, he was, like, snarky and condescending and kind of rude and blunt. While the crow in the, um, the crow in the movie, you know, he was, he kind of felt kinder, but, like, kind of blandly kind. kind. Like, he was just kind of a, that finger pointing, you know, go over there. Here, check out oh. this thing over here. Yeah, I mean, that's also what kind of made it a bit more, like, mystic feeling, because I think you get the feeling that Eric Draven has more of a psychic connection with the crow than anything. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, I just like the mystery behind it, as opposed to him actually coming out and saying, like, what he's saying. It's not a bad thing, necessarily, like, I respect it for what it is, but I just prefer the way the movie did it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about what I said about, like, it being that voice in your head? Like, I mean, I know you said you didn't have that, make that connection, but, like, has that changed yeah, your I mean, opinion or, any, or anything? Or is it just kind of like a, for you, is it just kind of like, oh, interesting interpretation, but... Yeah, it's an interesting interpretation. I've never had a panic attack. At least I'm, yeah, I haven't really had one. So I don't really have that experience to go on so right if you got more out of it than i did then more power to you right yeah oh, i was just wondering anyways and this is entirely you because it's your point the musical influences and i'm assuming well i mean i'm, I, I'm, I'm assuming we're mostly going to be talking about the movie here but i do know well, that no, we're not going to be talking about the movie but we're, i'll talk about the movie soundtrack in a completely different point but oh it's important to note wait, that... Wait, I don't see that point. Oh, wait, no, I, now I do. There you Never go. Mind. Yeah, but the book itself was inspired by a lot of uh, goth rock uh, bands like The Cure, for example, and a lot of, like, very uh, dark poetry. It's quoted a lot uh, within the book itself, and I know that in the version that we have, the special edition, and, like, the afterword, he lists, like the specific songs that influenced him. And, you know, the fact that the Crow himself is dressed like... He's dressed like a member of Kiss. He's he's dressed like a... like a goth rocker. And I think that the fact that it draws from a musical influence also helps with establishing the tone of the story, because you, in addition to being able to see what it looks like, if you follow the influences, you can hear what it's like it's it's one of the things i also liked about watchmen the way that it also wore its influences on its sleeve with like people like uh bob dylan and you know, 
yeah and all the songs that it quoted within it i think it just helps mm -hmm. establish the world better when a comic book does that yeah um i didn't get any of the references because like i don't know any of these bands they're just not my cup of tea however i will say sometimes it was a little distracting but sometimes i also kind of thought it was cool like i noticed they were talking to me it seemed like they were talking in some kind of poetry but you know now I, yeah. now that you now that you say it uh la, la, la. but yeah I guess it depends. I, I'm guessing you probably get more out of it if you actually know the songs they're referencing, because as I, you know, as I said, it's one of those things where it's like sometimes I found it distracting and it just seemed weird, and but sometimes I felt like it, it was actually if I felt like it had a, a actual purpose. Um, so yeah, I think the the thing that kind of kept it grounded for me is that a lot of the times like the other characters actually seemed to like you know they would still re respond with like what are you talking about you know la, la, la. like they, they reacted kind of the same way I was so it didn't pull me out of it too much yeah like the uh, the crow uh, Eric Draven himself speaks in riddles within the book which also like adds to his character I think yeah it yeah is it pretentious kind of but not enough to where it affects your enjoyment of the story, I don't think. it, And it, of course, fits with the tone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I like its musical influences and its influences, and I think that it drives the novel more. Right. And that's really what I wanted to say about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, we're actually going through this faster than I thought we would. Um, we're already, well, I would say a third of the way through the uh, podcast, and now we're moving to things we didn't like, and for the most part, I only, I, for the, for the most part, I really only had one, uh, one complaint and that was I, I noticed that you also put a third complaint here and I did feel that but I didn't want to criticize it because I knew what it was based off of yeah. Um, but yeah like I knew it was sort of a coping and wish fulfillment for the author so I figured that that was why um, but da -da -da, where are we um, so my first complaint is basically the villains that didn't feel minute. huh you what in a minute you said I'm gonna do something in a minute. I said we'll get to the 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 third point in a minute. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I don't know if I but, lagged there or whatever. Um, no, I just couldn't hear you all that well. Uh, all but right. anyways, so basically, the villains didn't feel like v real people. They just kind of felt like caricature caricature street thugs. A at first, I thought it was kind of being a little racist because the first thug we run into is a black man. And so I was terrified that we were going to have this, you know, I, th I was terrified this was going to be an uncomfortably racist uh, uh, comic. But actually, as it, you know, later on, the, the next, uh, I think all the, I think most of them are actually white. I know, yeah, I'm pretty sure most of the villains in this, in this story are white. So it's not a race yeah. thing. It's just a, this author is bad at writing good villains or at least real it it's mostly in the dialogue how basically this author is bad at writing realistic villain dialogue and that really pulled me out of the story it, it felt way too cartoony like you know in a, in a in a comic where everything else felt so real and visceral this just felt really lackadaisical if i'm using that term correctly i don't know um but yeah yeah i actually kind of uh disagree with that uh i mean granted compared to the movie these portrayals are a lot more realistic but when you describe them as caricatures um there are a lot of people maybe not that i know but that are actually like that there are people out there that are legitimately this like uh sociopathic and oh no it wasn't do talk it like wasn't that. 
I don't know. It wasn't that, yeah, it wasn't their, it wasn't what they were doing. Like, I know there are people who are that terrible and that dark and cruel. It was more so the way they were talking. Just, it was just their dialogue. Like, I'm a big stickler for dialogue. And I just, yeah, like, I know it's, I know, I, I, I know I've already mentioned Transformers twice, or once before in this video, but I'm gonna mention again. Like, there's, a, like, you know, there's a TV show, Transformers Prime, and the main villain of that is, like, incredibly cruel, like, you know, beats up, he's an, he's an abuser who, like, hospitalizes his subordinate at one point, and, like, is continually just viciously tearing through people, and his dialogue, like, at no point did I ever feel like his dialogue was something that a person wouldn't say, like, and that's what makes him terrifying, is because he is a person I could believe existing, and that's... Well, I, I don't think I should have to expand on that. He's a horrible, terrible person, and he felt very real. Even if he was a, a giant, like, 30-foot robot who, you know, can transform into a jet. But here, it's like, just the- it, it was just the way they talked, I hated it. And, uh, yeah. Like, what they were actually doing was totally believable, but, like, just the way they behaved. It, it, it felt like somebody who had never actually- met somebody who acts like that and was just doing their best impression. It was kind of like, you know, actually, yeah, before I keep going with this and run it into the ground, I, I, I feel like I've made my point. The, the movie got it a little bit better, but it's, the movie was a little bit more self-aware in the sense that it was more comedic, so I felt like it was, so the cartoonish dialogue felt a little better, and also they did improve the dialogue, but still. So, yeah, yeah um, I, I disagree on the whole dialogue front, but really all I have to say is that I, I do know people that, like, would talk like that. Right. But, yeah, so. Okay. Um, blah, blah, blah. Alright, so the next point is there's a, this little girl that he mates and kind of bonds with, and she just kind of comes out of nowhere. In the movie, they... Pardon me. In the movie, they fix this, and they actually say that, you know, basically she... It's kind of like their pseudo adopted kid, but um, and so the, you know it makes sense that they actually have this connection. And actually, it's probably my favorite part of the uh, of the entire movie. And it's just really cute and sweet. And she's a surprisingly realistic. Um, uh, she's a surprisingly realistic uh, child, which is really hard to get because usually they uh, usually they're either unrealistically sweet or they're irritating and annoying. Like they usually usually they only write one side of what children are like. But this one was actually this one was actually really nice, and I liked her, and she was cute and also kind of sassy, and she snapped at her mom, and and she, but she never got too mean to the point where I thought she was a brat, and like so yeah. But in in the in the comic, it just kind of felt like, oh, there's a kid now, and he cares about her. It's like, why of all the kids in Detroit does he care about this one kid he's never met before? But yeah, yeah I think it's because that. What I like about that character is that it she is a stark contrast to like the dark and brooding. Eric Draven, the fact that this, like, mm -hmm. sweet, innocent girl is being raised in this, like, hellhole of a neighborhood and just happens to be alone on this night. It shows both the crow's sensitive side and just, like, gives him a contrast to his own dark nature. It, right. it emphasizes the whole what I was talking about with the art, how it's all in black and white, and there's not really that many grays except for the flashback scenes. Right. It emphasizes that whole duality of good and evil, of like innocent and guilty. Like here's Eric Draven; he's had his innocence taken away from him, mm -hmm. and he sees this little girl being raised in this world, destined probably for that very same, like maybe not the same sort of. Mm -hmm. loss of innocence but eventually she will either be corrupted by this world or she'll have something traumatic happen to her which is just inherent yeah. in the world of the comic and yeah. i think it's more metaphorical of the author trying to like grasp onto that last bit of like 
joy and hope. Right. I, I think it works symbolically, although I do agree that as a character, she was done better in the movie, was a lot more three-dimensional, had a lot more personality. The actress was actually great. I wish I learned her name, but she was a great character right. in the movie. While the comic doesn't, like, necessarily develop her as much, I do think that it is, she is a good, like, contrast to Eric Draven and works very well in the story itself. Right. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, granted, it is a, a form of wish fulfillment, but, like, the entire uh, novel is wish fulfillment. And, I mean, we fulfillment in the next point or whatever, unless you have anything more to say on it. No, I think we've said anything to say. And um, so the next point is, which is yours, do you want to read it since it's your point? Yeah, it's a story about revenge, but the person taking revenge is the man as opposed to, like, the woman who definitely had way worse done to her within the novel. And I mean, yeah. like I said, explaining the story, if you know the story of, like, how the comic was made, it makes sense, but I think it is... I don't even necessarily consider it too much of a criticism, but I think it is important to point, point out. out. And it's just an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting way of uh, highlighting the whole wish fulfillment part of the novel, how I said it was both a strength and a weakness. Like, yeah. it is a good thing that this story feels raw, and it, in all honesty, I wouldn't want it any other way. However, that rawness does contain within it some flaws, which... You're talking about how in the comic book the thugs feel like caricatures, and I think the thing is they're meant to be more symbolic of the anger that the that James Obar was feeling while writing the novel. Right. It's mm -hmm. not about like developing these characters. It's literally they're it's about externalizing his trauma so that he his foil being the crow has something to fight against, and it's meant to be right. more of a catharsis for him coming to terms with that event which um we didn't i don't think we wrote any notes about this but let's talk about the ending the ending mm -hmm. to the comic book is different than it is in the movie because in the comic book he mm -hmm. doesn't he, i think i think he does kill like all the guys but that's not what brings him closure what brings him closure is that hallucination with the crow where he sees the white horse that's surrounded in barbed wire, and he's got to, like, mm -hmm. shoot the horse. And that's right. symbolic of him coming to terms with his trauma. Right. It's not the, uh... It's not the vengeance that lets the crow be... That lets Eric Draven be free. It's him recognizing his torment and finally learning to let that go. Right. Like the it's office, accepting that he... Yeah. It's accepting that he can't change the past, but also, well, I mean, I do. This kind of really only works if you live, if, but you know, accepting that you can't change the past, but that doesn't define your future. However, in this case, I mean, they both die, so you know. It's... Well, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. both die, but it's more about like getting that closure. Yeah. Like, ironically enough, James Obar has talked about he wrote the crow to get catharsis, right. but he also talks about how he never really got that from the novel. Right. You know, he thought that by externalizing his trauma mm. and putting it in a, in a comic book form, it was going to make him feel better, but to a degree, it made him feel worse, and it wasn't until much later. Like, he eventually did remarry, and his life, for sure, is God. going better now, especially with all the money he made off of it, but... <laughs> yeah. It's not about, like taking that vengeance and letting letting that anger out is an important part of dealing with any sort of trauma yeah but what's more important is learning to put that behind you as well and move on with your life right which is one of the only things in the movie that i think the comic did better right yeah and considering but, that's the whole point of the comic that's kind of, that's the main reason why i'd say the comic's better Absolutely. I mean, I think that the movie is better for a lot of other reasons, too. But Well, not better than the comic, but it is, in its own way, I think, just as good as the comic. But yeah, the comic I mean, I'm, I'm... is a bit different in terms of that. Yeah. The movie's still, the, the movie's still a, a, a decent, competently made movie, and it's still very enjoyable, but I, I just think the 
book is better. Yeah, and, I mean, that's an... Yeah. Well, and... But anyway, to the point yeah. of what I was talking about with the whole feminist argument of, like, why is it the woman? That's one of, like, yeah. the... I think that's the first criticism anybody can come up with and you know once yeah. you know the story it sort of makes sense but it is yeah, still like, important to yeah. talk about yeah i mean eric was yeah. shot in the head and you know and you know killed but his wife was gang raped and then killed and you know saw her husband get shot so you know it's like kind of like well why didn't the woman why didn't the why didn't they come back and take vengeance together or why didn't the woman come back since but at the same time, the reason I didn't bring it up or the reason I didn't think about it was because to me it just like I th I think I thought about that once, but then I real then I remembered that oh yeah this is this was something that the author wrote to cope with it. So you know the reason it's the man coming back and not the woman is because the author is a man and this is something he wrote to try and you know as you know to tr it's a it's a self insert story and he's trying to cope with something. So I mean. I'm not gonna get up in arms about it because I know why it was done and why it was done was you know it's it's not it has nothing to do with gender or anything like that but I, I, I can see why other people would be a lot more angry about it yeah uh, I mean I don't think anybody was angry I think that it's just like you know it was just a it's an interesting criticism and it brings up a good topic um yeah. Yeah. That's basically all I have to say about that. Right. And that concludes our um, things we didn't like. And now we're just mo now we're just on things worth mentioning, which we have main the main thing here is the movie and the sequels. Neither of us have seen the sequels or read the sequels. However, I felt the wor I felt worth men I felt they it was worth mentioning that they exist. And what I, yeah, you have... I was gonna say from what I understand about the sequels is I was told don't watch them, so I haven't. Yeah, neither have yeah. I, but they exist, so I feel obligated probably, to mention it's them. It's probably not worth it. They changed the. I think the whole point of the crow is like they change the uh, protagonist every time, so I'm not really sure if the sequels are about Eric Draven or if they're about uh, different characters going mm -hmm. through their own crow arcs but i think ultimately none of it is going to be as interesting as the original story was just because of how personal it was yeah and also it would kind of be a story we've already seen before uh, that, i mean you can do a lot with a template like that i mean there's a lot of anthology series around that are like that. I mean, every superhero, a lot of superhero origin stories are basically the same anyway, but there's yeah. a lot you can do with a template if you know how yeah. to use it right. True. But, um, yeah. the movie. I think that it's, Go ahead. Yeah. So I think the first thing to point about, out about the movie is the, uh, Brandon Lee, the star, because he is inherently attached to the movie and thus to the whole uh, mythos of the crow in general so i'm just going to start from the beginning so bruce lee is the son i mean not bruce lee brandon lee is the son of bruce lee and everybody knows who bruce lee is he was a famous uh martial artist and uh actor in movies who was tragically uh killed before one of his uh huge movies that was gonna transport him to stardom this was back in like the 70s so brandon lee did, grew up without his father, but idolizing his father and trying to follow in his footsteps by becoming a martial artist and becoming an actor. He had a string of kung fu movies before he eventually landed the role of the crow. Actually, a funny thing to point out is that uh, James O'Barr himself, when he first heard that Brandon Lee was cast as the crow, was against it. He wanted to cast somebody like Johnny Depp in the role. But what Brandon Lee brought to The Crow in the movie is a lot of his own stunt work and a lot of his, like, martial arts training that eventually went into it. I think he did have another stunt guy to do a look, the more dangerous stuff, but he himself brought a lot of his own physicality to the role. 
and unfortunately, he was tragically uh, killed while filming the uh, movie when a blank misfired, and that whole story and the fact that he died making that role is forever attached to the movie. And when I earlier in the podcast, I said that this whole franchise was like cursed to a degree. Uh, hi there. Uh, future Octavia jumping in right here f real quick. While I was editing this, uh, long story short, this part of the audio clipped out and became unusable. But to summarize what the weasel was saying, basically, Brandon Lee, son of Bruce Lee, and Brandon Lee was originally supposed to play the role of the crow. However, the author of the comic didn't like that. He wanted something more he wanted an actor like Johnny Depp to play with it. However, during filming, Brandon Lee died due to a uh, mishap with basically a uh, a gun was supposed to fire a blank, but accidentally fired a real bullet because of mistakes. And so Brandon Lee tragically died in while they were filming this movie. And because of that, as well as a few other things that happened during the production of this movie, some people actually believe this movie to be cursed. Anyways, uh, that's what you missed. Sorry for the technical difficulties. And it is, I think that he does bring a lot to the character, and while I don't necessarily think it's one of the greatest performances put on film, it was clear that he did put a lot of his, a lot of effort into the role, and it's a shame that he was uh, taken from us so early because of it. Right. Yeah, but that's what I wanted to talk about with Brandon Lee, and I wanted to get on to my other favorite part of the movie, which is the soundtrack. Yeah. Oh my Actually, god, this soundtrack. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Wait, before you start fanboying, I, I didn't really like the soundtrack. Like, it's not bad, but like when I was reading the book, I was more so picturing like instrumentals that were very slow and haunting and almost closer to sound effects or like ASMRs than actual, you know, music. Like I, you know, like I was and you know, like I was reading it and you know, you always picture these things or at least I picture these things when you're um when you're reading it and I was picturing something a lot more slow and creepy and sort of like almost you know, like Halloweenish fae sort yeah, like of gothic, thing. but not like goth yeah. rock. I think you were thinking more like yeah like old-fashioned goth like um, cathedrals I... like yeah. you know like cathedrals and devils and stuff like that but it was much more grungy and there was a lot more of that and it wasn't the worst i've seen but it did pull me out of it like a little like the first time i saw i you know watched it i was like oh or the first time i saw a clip from it and that music was playing in the back and i was like oh what and it was kind of jarring that being said, to some extent, I, it does kind of, it does kind of merge with the with what actually happens in the movie because at one point in the movie, Eric takes a electric guitar and he starts playing it on top of a uh, of a roof, like you know, like you do casual Friday, and um, you know, and they do say that he was in a band before he died. So to some extent, I get to some extent I get it, and it makes sense, but it's definitely not what I would have gone with. And also, I forgot to mention this, but the comic is black and white, like, entirely, while the movie is a lot more, like, it, you know, obviously it's in color, but it's a lot more red than anything else, and that's, I didn't like that, because it just felt a little too artificial, but, but for the most part, the cinematography was good, it was just that one little nitpick that I hate, but, like, how everything was just layered in red, and it just, yeah, it was distracting. But back to, now you can, okay, now you can fanboy about the soundtrack. Yeah. So everything that you just said is a reason why I love the movie. The fact yeah, that the soundtrack it... is so grungy. Like, it's just it's just my genre in particular, and I, I wasn't going to talk about the cinematography, but talking about the cinematography, red, the, the red contrast, it, not contrast, but it just complements, like, the black and white so well like that those are that's my favorite combination of colors is black white and red mm. i just like 
the whole style of the movie and i mean like even the comic book itself like i'm talking about the its musical influences i understand that when you were reading it you were thinking more like uh gothic in terms of like yeah like actually yeah, i was like, thinking more like you know cathedral, wandering into like the yeah, like yeah, something out wandering, of like, or wandering into the forest during a, during a fog. Yeah, while, like a gothic being... architecture, yeah. like a gothic type of. Yeah, I was thinking more along the lines of goth rock. I could, you can tell just from the way he looks, and maybe this is just because this is like rock is the genre that I typically mm -hmm. listen to a lot. But you can clearly see that it's influenced by like eighties metal. Uh, the crow himself looks like a member of Kiss, mm -hmm. and I, I could just tell its influence like right off the bat, just because it's the genre that I listen to. And the soundtrack for the movie, oh my god, Stone Temple Pilots, uh, Rage Against the Machine. Uh, who else? Nine Inch Nails. The fact that they got the band The Cure to actually write an original song for the soundtrack when James O'Barr himself has said that their music before that was a huge influence on the comic itself. The fact that it all just comes full circle, I I just... No, it's so bass-heavy, which fits so well with, like, the urban decay and just, like, the overall dark and deep tone of everything. It's just one of my favorite... Uh, movie soundtracks. Mm -hmm. Not as good as the Spider-Man 2 soundtrack, but it's up there. Yeah. I'm gonna say it's like my third or fourth favorite movie soundtrack. Yeah. But yeah, I just... I love it. Love it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it does mostly come down to personal taste, and maybe I would have liked it better if I watched the movie first and then read the book, but I, mean, I read the book first. It's also probably so. part of it, but I mean, like... Even the yeah. book itself does have a lot of, like, very, not necessarily punk influence, but a lot of, like, goth rock music. If you're gonna, I would actually say this band isn't in the soundtrack, but if there's one band that I think fits the tone of The Crow, it's called uh, Typo Negative. They're, they're right. specifically goth rock. Right. And they fit the tone really well. Okay. Yeah, well, the the only other thing on our point is, or on the uh, point on, is the movie, or the only other point we have left is something we already covered, and that is basically me just explaining why I prefer the comic. Then we just have the last point, or, you know, is you saying possible reboot? Is is that going to happen? Or yeah, I've been, I don't there's know. been a lot of talk about it. There was one brief moment, and I think like, like 2019, where there was talk of Jason Momoa playing the crow in a reboot and um yeah. i don't think that f in terms of physicality he fits the role because i think when everybody pictures the crow they picture like a skinny guy who's like good at doing flips or whatever and jason momo i think he is a bit too ripped for that yeah. i think in terms of acting he would nail the role but i'm not sure if i can see I as yeah, I would like the crow to... unless he like lost a lot of weight yeah, actually, I I do think like they I I can't maybe not a re I think maybe a reboot is the wrong word but like a remake movie of the um of the origin of the original, but honestly I would like to I in general I usually prefer animation to live action and especially for comics you know like I think it'd be really cool if we had like an animation style that emulated what we see in the comics, I think that would be really cool. I mean, you could also pull that off on film, too. They did it with uh, Sin City back in 2005. Yeah, I never watched that, but I, I saw, you know, I saw what it looked like. No, I, I don't mean like that. I, I didn't... That was, that that looked that looked good, but I don't think it would... I, that's, I don't think that style would work for The Crow. I, I, I want something more like what the actual comic looks like. Well, I mean, The Crow itself is pretty, like, noir. It also wears that yeah. influence. Like, you were talking about, like, the whole Daredevil. It was written by uh, Frank Miller, who also wrote Sin City, and clearly he was also an influence on James O'Barr. Actually, like, I think James O'Barr, from just The Crow, I think to a degree he's a better writer than Frank Miller, but Frank Miller is also a really good 
yeah really good writer who obviously has a lot of influence in like noir which is inherently based on like maybe not urban decay but just that urban landscape mm -hmm. yeah but okay. i feel like um an animation would be interesting to see especially yeah. it would be easier for getting those surreal uh scenes down that weren't in the movie yeah, I just want to see the that really stark black and white, you know, those black and white images that are really detailed that, yeah. moving. I think that would be so uh, cool. We need, I and, agree, and just that would be amazing to see. Yeah, and just in general, like, we need more, like, you know, this one has a freaking talking crow. So I'm pretty sure, like, I... I, 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 I keep trying to look up how much it costs to, like, you know, do animation versus do live action but it always depends on like what exactly they're doing but still like I know i'm pretty sure that so, sorry yeah, go ahead. i'm pretty sure it would be a lot cheaper to do a 2d animation of like the crow talking and flying and moving around than doing this like hyper realistic 3d model of it it just i i think it would just be more practical and look better I mean, uh, would they do a 3D model? I think that would be a good question, because the yeah. crow in the movie is, you know, a real crow. I'm not sure you'd really have to do much to uh, make that kind of a scenery come to life. Like, I was going to say, I know that there are filmmakers that were able to make incredibly, like, detail not well and very well detailed i guess for the time special effects on a budget of like a hundred thousand dollars which in terms of movie production is like pocket change yeah yeah so i think like if you give it to the right person it'd be good you wouldn't have yeah. to use too much cgi give it to like a yeah, but birds, just... like a animals in general, but corvids especially, cor corvid corvids or corvids or that family of birds specifically, those are in the lines of they do not, they will not learn unless they want to learn. They are very stubborn birds. They are very intelligent birds, so I don't know, I don't know how likely it is, like, I don't know how common a stunt crow is, and I don't know how, like, I don't think you could just take any random crow and do it. But if you have a got, stunt crow, I mean, I guess you could do it. Yeah. I get what you're saying about the crows, though. I got, like, a bunch of crows that live outside my house, and they're assholes. Me too. One they're almost, my... like... I was walking up my, my driveway, and one almost shat on me. <laughs> oh, dear. It I don't was, know. It I... was, like, a, it was like a foot away from my left shoulder, too. And I heard a splat as I was walking up my driveway, and I look up, and I'm like, what the hell? Yeah. I don't know. I, I have crows and I feed them peanuts every morning, but they're very timid and they don't, uh, they're very shy and they, every time, like, even if I just peek my head out the window, they'll fly away. And actually, I have, a, I, ironically, the bluebirds that are half their size keep bullying, keep trying to bullying them out of the peanuts, but yeah. I think we've gone off topic now, and I think that's everything we have to say, unless you have anything left. No, nah, I don't really have much else to say. Um, right. Do you want to talk about the uh, the last part of the uh, movie that was 20 minutes? Because I don't think we actually got into the whole like final battle thing. I don't know if you want to talk about that or because I know you no, had some. No, not great really. I mean, I, I mean, I'll summarize it. But basically, you know, the the little girl Sarah, she gets kidnapped by the main villain of the movie, and Eric has to go save her and all this stuff. But uh, it wasn't bad, it just- it was just unnecessary and I got bored, so, I mean, I don't really have any more to say about it than that. So, I think that's everything! Alright, uh, well, until then, I shall leave the audience on these words of wisdom. Oh, wait! I haven't done what I- I haven't decided- usually at the end of the podcast we say what we're gonna do next. Um... Probably unsurprisingly, I haven't decided which comic exactly, but for my next pick, I definitely want to do one of the IDW uh, uh, Transformers comics. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, basically, I, you know, as I said, I was getting into a lot of TV shows that I watched as a kid, and I was like, oh yeah, I used to be a Transformers fan, and I learned that there were IDW comics, and... Apparently, like, the overall, 
overall what I've heard from them, and I've already read uh, two, they were just two random one-shot ones, and they looked, they were pretty good, but from, basically from what I've heard, they, um, they have, a, there's a lot of, they have a lot of flaws, but they also have, like, really good character, like, really in-depth characters, and, you know, I like that. That's the main reason I was. That's the main reason I watched the TV shows, and I like the TV shows, so I'd like to try that out. All right. Yep. So next episode, we'll do one of the Transformers IDW comics. Uh, would you like to do our outro now? Absolutely. I shall impart these words of wisdom. Jesus Christ walks into a motel. He hands the clerk three nails and says can you pin me up for the night <laughs> I and that's all I that. wanted to say alright so all until right. next time yep I am Octavia and this is my co-host the weasel I am, and, I am the weasel and happy readings good night everyone get out of here